Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I almost said welcome back. It's welcome for the first time. Welcome to our course on the Inferno. Not exactly a course. Fun series of discussions. Looking forward to talking about Dante with you guys. Um, so this is going to be a lot of fun uh, and uh, a great way uh, for all of us, I think, to... Um, not think about other things. So we're discussing Dante today. And I'm going to confess something. I'm going to I'm going to confess something here and that is I've never taught Dante in my life before. I've studied Dante quite a bit. Uh indeed I even wrote my master's thesis on Dante mostly because people told me I shouldn't, <laughs> I suspect, in retrospect. But um, I, um, I, yeah, so I'm, um, I, but as I said, I've never taught, I've never taught Dante before. And the main reason I've never taught Dante before is basically I've never really felt qualified to teach Dante before. Primarily, number one thing, I don't know Italian. I don't know Italian. I never had the time to learn. Maybe someday I will get the chance to do that. It's Italian is on my list. It's not the very top of my list, but it's on my list of languages I would love to learn. Um, but I've just, I've never had the time. And so, you know, I've never felt like I've been able to, you know, I was, Dante was one of those things that I was like strongly considering at the beginning of my graduate uh, studies uh, of being like, okay, I really want to focus and be a Dante guy. Uh, in the end, I found as much fun as I found in talking about Dante. Um, I then like really sort of rediscovered Chaucer. I'd already read Chaucer before, but I, you know, in the end I was like, okay, no, I think I'm going to be a middle English guy. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's, 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 you know, that's what it is. Uh, and, uh, and so I never, I never, you know, I never, I, cause I, you know, I ended up since I was doing, uh, since I was doing middle English stuff, I ended up doing other things for language. I ended up focusing my language studies on, on, uh, on my, you know, French and old French and Latin. And I ended up, uh, never getting to Italian. So that's one issue that I've always had. And the other issue of course is Dante is good grief. I don't know. There are very few works of literature. Certainly if you exclude the Bible, um, there are very few works, period, uh, that have been studied more in depth and in more detail than Dante has. Um, there's just, it's such a, such a huge field. So again, so many, for so many reasons, I always felt like, well, I don't know if I could really do justice to Dante. Um, more than Shakespeare, Bruce. Well, let me say different from Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare, of course, in the English tradition is by far the most highly revered uh, author. And he's been, of course, uh, this is a little bit of Lytotes, studied a very great deal. And yet, um, I bet you that you could find lines of Shakespeare plays, probably a bunch of lines of Shakespeare plays that have never had things written about them. Like particular lines that have never been the focal point of study uh, for whereas you will not find that <laughs> for Dante. You will not find a line, word or syllable in the Divine Comedy that has not had like whole conferences <laughs> focused on it, essentially. Um, it's just, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, and the same thing with Joyce's Ulysses, Serena, come on, I no, it's, there's, there's no comparison. There's no, I mean, again, there's a lot of people. I'm not trying to take anything away. I'm, this is not a, which one is greatest comparison. I'm just saying when it comes to like entire schools of scholars, uh, focusing on trying to gloss every single word, uh, of a text, there's there's Dante. I I just I don't know of anyone uh, of any writer again anywhere outside the Bible that has received that kind of attention um, uh, as Dante has. So it's a uh, it's this you know from a like scholarly standpoint it's you know this sort of uh, intimidating world to get into, especially you know because like. I'm not Italian and I don't, I don't even read Italian. So I got, like I said, I, you know, but so what I'm trying to say is 
thank you guys for electing Dante and helping me get over my, uh, my, um, uh, uh, you know, my inferiority complex about teaching Dante, because this is going to be fun. Now, Tom, Homer, I agree. Homer is, I, 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 I bet you Dante even beats Virgil. Um, maybe. I mean, if you count all the medieval commentaries, probably not. Uh, Virgil and Homer would be the only two that I think would be really in competition with Dante for that, uh, for that title, really. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, uh so anyway, so this is going to be a lot of fun. So I appreciate this. Now, I, let me, but having said that, let me start with two disclaimers. Did I mention I don't do Italian? So I'm not going to be able to be much help when it comes to that. Um, which means we're going to spend way less time looking at <clears throat> like the poetics than I normally would. I know many of you have been joking about the fact that, you know, we're reading this work, which is, an enti which is like entirely poetry all the way through and knowing the pace at which I normally discuss poems in my classes uh, that, you know, we would like, you know, end up taking, uh, you know, five years to read our way through Inferno. That is not going to be the case um, because, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's it's not going to be the case because I, I'm not I mean I'm not going to subject the translation to that kind of analysis and I don't know the original well enough. Um, so anyway, so so that's again, uh, you know, one uh, uh, disclaimer. We're going to do a little bit of it. I do want to uh, uh, to glance at at least some of the most important elements uh, of the way that uh, uh, the way that that the poetry works, but. Um, we're not going to spend much time on it. So what we do with it tonight will be a lot of what we do. Not all, but a lot of what we do. Uh, now, here's my other disclaimer. Uh, here, my, other, my other disclaimer, and this is like Dante would not approve uh, at all of this. Um, I am not... Um, yeah, disclaimer slash confession. I'm not super interested in the politics of late 13th century Florence. Just going to put that out there, right? I'm just really not. I, 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 Dante was very much. This matters to him a very great deal. Um, to me, of course, I find that it's one of the things when I read Dante, I can tell how passionate he was about this. And it's not that there's nothing interesting that can be drawn uh, from it. But not only is the political matter, that is the stuff that relates to, you know, contemporary, uh, you know, uh, 13th and early 14th, 14th century politics uh, in Italy, uh, the most sort of obviously kind of dated element of the entire book. I mean, this is this is a this is a work which deals with many, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 evergreen themes and concepts. Um but uh, but obviously, exactly who was doing what in the political uh, arena, you know, in Florence in the 1290s, less so, less evergreen than the rest of it. Um, so that's one thing, of course. But the other thing is that it's also, if I had to say off the top where I feel like Dante's greatest weakness is, I would say that it was that. That is... It's when he's dealing with his political peers uh, and the whole political scene that he tends to get, um, uh, you know, more ad hominem, more like invested in his own agenda, basically. And uh, and to me, that is re that is really kind of where he um, departs from just some of the more really transcendent stuff that he is doing throughout all of the rest, you know, at the same time as all of the rest of this. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's, um, <laughs> yeah, right. Stephen says, if we're not focusing almost exclusively on the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, what else could we possibly talk about in all these classes? Well, I know. And like I said, it's not like Dante himself would be sympathetic to my confession that I am probably going to downplay a lot of the politics. Um, so anyway, that's my other disclaimer. Now, uh, two more things uh, before we get uh, before we dig into the text. First, um, I know 
that Dante's verse is difficult to understand. Difficult to understand because it's obscure. That is, he kind of speaks around things and or, but it's not just that, like, I cannot comprehend these words that are in front of me uh, or how they go together. Rather, it's a I can tell he's alluding to something and I don't understand the reference. Right. So there is um, there is a strong desire. I, I mean, whenever I'm reading Dante, I feel it very strongly. There's this like twitch that you get, like I've, I've got to check the notes, right? I, I've got to check the notes because I don't understand what he's referring to. He's obviously referring to somebody or something in that line, and I don't know what it is, right? And you're gonna experience all the time that twitch to go look it up. What is the thing that he's referring to? I, hmm, I want to invite you. I can require you. This isn't a course. I can't boss you around. I would like to invite you to resist that impulse or at least to postpone that impulse. Um, and there are a couple reasons for that. One reason for that is that if you give in to that twitchy sensation every time you feel the impulse to go and figure out, like, look at the answer key, right? Look at the code uh, and try to understand what he's really getting at, you know, what he's referring to in the passage, um, you're going to lose the poetry entirely, right? You need, I think it's super, this is short, right? If you were to sit down and read the translation of Canto 1 aloud, it would take you, what, like four minutes, five minutes? It's not very long, right? Um, so just sit down, just read it through at least once, ideally twice. The reading assignments are not going to be long. We're not going to ever talk about more than three cantos at a time. So it's like 15 minutes of reading if you read it all aloud. If you read it you know, silently with your eyes, you could probably do it faster, right? Do it. I would recommend more than once. Read it once, twice, maybe even three times without looking at the notes. Try to follow the story that he's telling. Try to see sort of the shape. I'm not just saying... It's more fun if you puzzle it out yourself and you don't look at the answers in the back of the book. That's kind of true, too, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is don't lose, don't treat the poem like, um, you know, merely as something to be decoded, right, with somebody else's answers, especially since those things which you come across, which give you that impulse to look in the back of the book and read the notes, a, a lot of times... Nobody really knows what he's referring to. That is, there's not a definitive answer. You'll read a bunch of debate and you'll read somebody's theory about what that means, but their theory might not be better than your idea. You read it. You think about it first. Just think about it yourself first, right? Uh, get what you can, everything that you can out of it. Then after you've done that, by all means, read the notes. I'm not saying never do, um, but uh, I want to strongly recommend that method of reading Dante and our discussions are going to be less focused on, you know, again, kind of going through and piecing together the, you know, like the, again, like I want to focus less on decoding and more on, um, into sort of like the flow and the shape, uh, of what he's doing and kind of tracking the stories, multiple stories really, uh, that he's, um, uh, uh, that he's, that he's doing. Um, yeah. And Serena, I agree. His poetry is really lively. Uh, if you just read it smoothly, absolutely. Yeah. If you just go through it's, um, whereas again, if you stop and look up some, which you'll, which you'll want to do, there'll be times when you want to almost every line. I mean, the notes section for Canto one is like three times as long as the Canto, right? Which is normal, right? I mean, it's, I get that. That's fine. I mean, he was really restrained. He could have said so much more. Um, but, um, uh, anyway, yeah, Lynn, I am monitoring Twitch. Uh, yes, I am. Um, secondarily, I confess, but it's it's all it's all right there. Um, uh, anyway, okay, so uh, yeah, <laughs> Tarlonia, I see, was saying uh, that it makes her feel better to realize that nobody knows what he was talking about in some places because uh, uh, <laughs> she she doesn't have the time. Exactly, I understand. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, Stephen, exactly. I, I, people who have done in-depth Bible study and stuff, for instance, hopefully you've been told the same thing, right? Try to understand the passage on its own first before you go reading commentaries and stuff. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Um, okay, so, right. Serena wants to know where to chat among yourselves. Uh, there are two places. So if you go to uh, one place, our old chat room, which has been up for many years uh, and... I, I got to admit to you guys, I've been kind of like meaning to phase that out for a long time. But I just can't bear to do it because you guys use it and it's fine. So anyway, that's where it's there still. Uh, there should be a link to that on the MythGuard, MythGuard.org page to the, the little chat now box. Um, and um, but of course, you can also chat with other people on the Twitch chat as well. Um, so if you want to take part of an ongoing discussion, which I should I uh, warn you, there's a great deal of puns. <laughs> there's there's a, a large volume of puns exchanged, as so I hear, uh, in the regular chat room. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Yana, I know you guys will riot if I ever phase that out. That's why I haven't done it. Uh, it's just just for you guys. Like, that's, that's pretty much... That's all we use it for, and that's fine. Um, but... Um, <laughs> anyway, okay. Yeah, Devorah's like, what? I'm missing out on puns? Oh, yes, Devorah, you're missing out on puns. So, yes, you're welcome to do that. But, of course, the questions box in GoToWebinar is where I primarily primarily see comments for me and, and, and uh, questions for me. So that's the primary thing I'm monitoring. I am looking at the Twitch chat as well for those who are following along there. Um, so, all right. Um Okay, <laughs> so you've been hitting homers already, have you, Carrie? All right, yeah, no, I, I get that. I, I'm not surprised to hear it. Um, okay, so I said there were two things I wanted to say before we dug into the text. That was one, my um, appeal uh, to ask you to um, read the text first. And our discussions are going to follow along those same lines as well. I mean, you know... You know my methods, Watson, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, my first goal as we're discussing the passage together is going to be really kind of focusing on the passage and trying to come to a sort of inductive understanding of the passage as we read it, rather than you know always being like, being, oh wait, what is that alluding to again? Um, so some of that stuff will come in, but um, but that's not always or sort of generally going to be our first, uh, um, uh, uh. uh yeah, it's it, it's not always going to be our first uh, um, our first move there. Now, the second and last thing that I want to discuss before we dig into the text, we need to talk a little bit about allegory, um, because Dante is writing allegory, and what he's doing in the text here is something that he would have expected his readers to follow. Um, and so I want to make sure to give you guys kind of the key to that, because allegory is not something that we do so much anymore in the modern world. So um, let's do a little um, uh, a little refresher course on allegory and how medieval allegory works. Now, uh, there are two different kinds of allegory. Two tr traditional, these are two traditional medieval categories of allegory. There's the allegory of the poets, and there's the allegory of the theologians. Now, the allegory of the poets is what is generally referred to as personification allegory. That is, if you want to tell a story in allegorical terms, uh, like, for instance, the famous play Every Man, right, where, like, every man and he meets the vices and virtues and stuff, or, of course, the famous medieval uh, uh, poem, The Romance of the Rose is a personification allegory where the, uh, you know, the the lover enters, uh, you know, the garden of pleasure and, um, you know, encounters a bunch of allegorical abstractions and stuff and extremely scandalous things. And so um, that's that kind of thing. Obviously, I think probably the most famous uh, and consistent um, generally uh, a personification allegory in the English tradition, of course, uh, is Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is a personification allegory. Bunyan uh, it, it is quite good uh, at personification allegory. My, fa my favorite part, Bunyan is such a thoroughly devoted personification allegorist that he um, sometimes his allegorical characters will like break the fourth wall in really fun ways. Uh, like the guy who says, my name is Honest, and I hope I am. <laughs> I 
just love that. Can never get enough of Bunyan. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so that's personification allegory. And the point of personification allegory, um, you do have a, a, a meaning that you're trying to convey, right? This is what, and of course, Tolkien fans, and I know that not all of you listening now are Tolkien fans, but I know that a great many of you are, so I have to address, I can't talk about allegory to Tolkien fans and not address the elephant in the room. Um, and this is, of course, what Tolkien was referring to when he talked about the purposed domination of the, of the author, that he prefers the freedom of the reader to apply a story to various things rather than the purposed domination of the author. And what he meant by that was an author who is trying to convey a particular book. You are supposed to interpret the story in this particular way. Um, but um, uh, anyway, so um, the, uh, the, 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 the purpose of personification in a, well, okay, purpose, <clears throat> that's a big statement. One of the things, one of the, one of the things I would argue that, well, I wouldn't say that Tolkien misses that point, but in the context, of course, he's defending uh, against personification interpretations of the Lord of the Rings. He's trying to prevent people from interpreting the Lord of the Rings as personification allegory. And so that's why he's sort of downplaying it uh, and even dissing it in the way that he is uh, in that prologue when he says that. Um, but of course, I mean, you can call it purposed domination of the author if you like. You can also call it a really fun game, right? I mean, it's like a puzzle that you're setting your readers and they have to figure it. And there's a right answer, right? Sometimes more than one right answer. Um, you know, you can kind of work out the puzzle in a couple different ways. Um, and this kind of game, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a cross between literature and parlor game, essentially. Um, and that's fun. That's super fun. Who doesn't enjoy that? I mean, anyway, medieval people certainly enjoyed that. Um, so, but of course, there's another point about allegory and that when you are using personification allegory, that is generally what one tends to be doing when one is writing allegory of this kind, is taking abstract ideas and representing them as concrete things, right? So you have, uh, you know, instead of trying to describe the really quite abstract and difficult to, uh, you know, kind of capture, right? Uh, you know, moral struggle that somebody might be having between, you know, an inclination, you know, like a, a desire to adhere to a, to, a, to a virtue and a temptation by a vice, right? Instead of like tr just trying to describe a person in that moral quandary, you extract it, right? And so you, you have a character, uh, you know, whose name is patience and a character whose name is wrath and you describe them, right? So you get to describe them with rich and luxurious detail. And by describing them in detail, you are getting to, uh, work out a lot of things about that thing. What is patience like, right? How does patience feel? How does patience act? What is it? What does it mean? Right. Um, and all of those things you can really work out in really fascinating detail through descriptions, through things like how are they related? So like the character named Patience, what is the relationship between the character named Patience and like those other virtues? Like sometimes they're like cousins or sisters or whatever. You know, anyway, like there are lots of things that you can do in order to try to kind of um, put your finger on some of these really abstract concepts. And then you get to make them interact with each other and everything. So it's not just a kind of quiz game, right? It's not just a parlor game. It's also a way of conveying, of, 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 of capturing, of dramatizing, really, um, often, usually, completely abstract things. Um, so that, I think, is um, uh, also really fun. I love allegory. I've always loved allegory. I like reading allegory. Um, I'm kind of sad that more people don't write allegory anymore. I think that that's a lot of fun. But that's one kind of allegory. That's the allegory of the poets. Called that because it's a kind of game. It's a kind of poetic game. But there's also the allegory of the theologians. And the allegory of the theologians is different in two ways. The first and most important way in which it is different is that it's a 
completely different sort of allegory in the sense that it is not an allegory of writing, it is an allegory of reading. It is a way of interpreting texts rather than a way of generating text, of composing texts. Allegory of the poets is something you sit down and do, right? Um, you write a story which is operating on more than one level. It's literally a story of these characters interacting and the, you know, the sort of adventures that are happening or whatever, right, with these characters in your story. But of course, there's this other level, uh, the, like the moral level, very, uh, very um, uh, uh, often uh, in the Middle Ages, where these abstract ideas are, are interacting and being on and this sort of uh, second narrative, right, is being kind of unfolded. That's the game that a, that a writer plays. But readers, oh, readers can do much more, right? And uh, it's called the allegory of the theologians because this is how scripture was read. Um, it is about, now, not exclusively scripture. Of course, this same technique can be applied to many other things, but especially Virgil, right? especially poets Virgil and Ovid. Oh my goodness. We did this with Virgil and Ovid for hundreds and hundreds of years in the Middle Ages. Um, we just love this. Um, and again, it's a way of uh, drawing even more edification out of a text. Now, there's, um, there's a certain bias in the modern world. Uh, like a question that people are always asking when they're reading about medieval exegesis, like medieval interpretation of scripture and stuff. Um, a, a, like a thing that modern people are always saying is like, D you know, this doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't read things that way. But the reason they say you can't read things that way is they're like, cause like, there's no way that like, why, what authority do we have to believe that scripture was written with all like these different levels, simultaneous levels of significance in mind at a time. Right. And I believe that your medieval theologian would respond to the, this modern person by saying, no, 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 wait, you're misunderstanding. It is not about the intention of the author. It's not about the intention of the author, right? It is about the edification that can be drawn from the text. Right. We are led to. Re it's it, yeah. So it's it's not. So don't mistake the two. There's the allegory of writing and there's the allegory of reading. Right. Again, it's not to say that, you know, when, um, you know, Moses sat down to write Exodus, he had in mind, you know, the multiple layer allegory that it's it doesn't matter. He doesn't have to know it. Um, he doesn't have to plan it. It just doesn't work like that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So Jennifer, exactly. This, it's the allegory of the theologians. That is, if you've heard about like St. Augustine, for instance, talking about how the Song of Solomon, right, which sounds like erotic love poetry, um, is of course actually talking about the relationship between Christ and the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes, that is exactly this kind of reading. Now, was Solomon thinking about Christ in the church when he wrote that? The evidence suggests no, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. We're not bothered by that one little bit. So, um, um, uh, and yes, Michelle, it's very like uh, what Steve and Trish do in their podcast in the final segments. Yes, they're applying some of these exact same reading uh, uh, techniques. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's one of the things I love most about that podcast. Um, absolutely. Um, OK. So. Because keep in mind, you could say, well, there's a way around this whole intention question, right? You could say, well, there's the intention of the human author of scripture. And then there's the intention of the Holy Spirit who is inspiring it, right? And the intention of the Holy Spirit who is inspiring it can easily transcend what the original writer was aware of, right? Um, sure. So in, in <clears throat> when it comes to scripture, that is perfectly well a way around that. Um, but they didn't just apply this to scripture. They applied this, as I said, to Virgil and Ovid too. They applied this to Ovid, like the allegory of love and the metamorphoses. They read Ovid, who was not an exceptionally pious person, um, nor 
a very sterling uh, moral teacher, really. I mean, I, I, you know, perhaps some would say, who am I to cast stones? But, you know, I'm just going to go out on a limb there and say he's not, wouldn't be my first choice of, like, moral teacher, right? Um, but, um, but yet... We have like, uh, you know, the old French Ovid Moralise, right, which is this detailed commentary on Ovid, um, which gives a moral allegory to everything <laughs> that happens, like in the Metamorphosis. Like it turns out it's all, in fact, a moral allegory. They knew I, they, they weren't bothered <clears throat> about the fact that Ovid didn't intend these things. It's not what they were interested in. Um, this was about what edification can be drawn from this text, and edification could be drawn from this text. So great! Um, that's uh, uh, there. Uh, there we are. Oh yeah, darn it! What is wrong with me? I must be getting old or something. Sorry. Yeah, I forgot to share my uh, slides with you guys in the net mode. I've not been showing anything too astounding so far. Um, uh, though you missed my, uh, you missed my portrait of Dante, right? I thought Dante is the kind of guy who would appreciate having his portrait on the title. There are several images I was considering, you know, for like the title slide, uh, for, you know, the Inferno discussion, but I was like, you know, Dante would prefer his own profile. I think pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clearly he, he was, he was that kind of bear. Um, but, um, anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> you're right, Zach. I never, uh, I'm looking at this, uh, image with a new context. It does almost look like he has a, a face mask hanging from one ear, right? That he's going to put back across. <laughs> it, it almost looks like that. I, I never thought of it that way before, but now I have this new perspective <laughs> on the Dante portrait. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, anyway, um, but yeah, D Dante's profile is very famous. Uh, uh, that knows. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I was on a trip with my wife. We were touring houses in, uh, Newport, Rhode Island. We'd never been down to Newport. So we, we went down to Newport uh, a little while ago. Uh, and there was a, there was a, an image, a little, uh, cameo. Uh, up above a door. We saw it from a distance and I'm like, it's Dante. And she's like, how do you know? I'm like, look at the nose. And it was, this is clearly Dante. And then we got closer and we could see the, the laurel wreath. And I'm like, oh yeah, that is so Dante. Um, but uh, anyway, okay. Um, so, but let me get back to the allegory of the theologians. Cause there's another thing that you need to know about the allegory of the theologians. So again, on the one hand, it's a way of reading, not a way of writing. Usually. Second thing, the other thing that differentiates the allegory of the theologians is that it suggests a different kind of relationship with the primary level of the text. Let me explain what I mean by that. In the allegory of the poets, so when you're reading something like Pilgrim's Progress or Every Man or something like that, right, the point of the text, the, the real story is that top layer, right? Um, what is being dramatized through the allegory. So, like, what actually happens between the characters on the ground level, as it were, like in the literal level of the allegory, It's that's not the real story, right? The real story. Um, what you're, you're supposed to use that as a tool, essentially, right? As, like, a set of clues to perceive. And once you perceive the big picture and you get the point... This actual character whose name is Patience, she doesn't matter, right? Or rather, she only matters in as much as she is helping you to contemplate and perceive some things about the idea of Patience. But the point of that character in the story is conveying to you these ideas about Patience. It's not about, like, that character doesn't have a life of her own. The character in the narrative doesn't have a life of her own. If you see, do, do, do you see what I mean by that? What this means is that when you're reading a personification allegory, once you get it, right, once you see 
the appropriate level, once you get the point, um, then you kind of throw away the rest. The rest of the story doesn't actually matter, right? You kind of chuck it out the window and keep the thing. I mean, this is, you know, Chaucer uses this language, you know, you, you throw away, you know, once you, once you have, have gotten, um, the, the, the seed, like the, the kernel of wheat out of the chaff, you throw away the chaff, right? And you have the kernel, uh, left. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's, it's language that Chaucer uses. Um, that's a very common way of talking about interpreting this sort of allegory. Footnote. This, I believe, is why Tolkien is so adamant. It's not just that he disagreed with the particular allegorical reading. It's not, like, it's not only that he was like, please don't be thinking of Hitler only, or thinking I'm just trying to make a point about Hitler when you're reading about Sauron, right? It's not just that he thought they were doing a bad job of reading it allegorically. He did think that, but it wasn't just that. Even if they were doing a brilliant job of reading it allegorically, still the effect of reading allegory. Again, the effect of doing that, if you accept, if you believe, if, if, if it's held to be, if it's understood by you to be true, uh, that this is the proper way to read this story, that this is that kind of story, then once you get it, you're going to throw it away. Like, you know, so you're going to cease to care about Sauron and Gandalf and Frodo and everything else, right? The whole story becomes irrelevant once the kernel has been... So once you have perceived the truth of the story, which is all about the atomic bomb and about Hitler or whatever, right? Um, if it were an allegory, then, then that would be the point, right? And all of these other characters running around doing something are meaningless on their own. And that is the thing that, like, made Tolkien want to bite the furniture in frustration. Like, he hated that action. And that's why he was so adamant in saying, it's not an allegory, not an allegory, not an allegory. Don't throw it away. Don't throw it. This is not chaff here, people, right? Don't throw it away. Um, so, um, anyway, so that, I, that's, I believe, why. And this, by the way, P.S., is also why the Chronicles of Narnia are not an allegory. They are not an allegory, not in this way, because again, like it's it's you don't throw away Aslan when you, it's not the same thing and it doesn't work. You can't decode the Chronicles of Narnia. Yes, Aslan is Jesus. Yes, but it's not allegorically. That's not how it, he's not an allegory of Jesus. Uh, be, if so, then like who's Susan? Right. Who's Mr. Beaver? Like you'd be able to do it all the way through. And Lewis is really good at allegory. Um, it, it would work. If he were writing allegory, it would work. Um, but he's not writing allegory. Um, it's it's like allegory, but it is not, in fact, an allegory in the same way. Um, but anyway, end side note uh, and end footnote there. So, OK, so that's the allegory of the poets. Now, the allegory of the theologians is very importantly different. Because when you are doing an allegorical reading of scripture, you don't want to throw away the literal level. The literal level is important, too. So let me give you an example. Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea towards the promised land, out of Egypt and towards the promised land. Right now, that is a story from the Old Testament that has been, uh, you know, presented itself on a silver platter for an allegorical reading, right? It's really easy to do that kind of reading, right? Um, here's like the, so that, you know, like the people of Israel are, are like, they're like the human soul, right? Or like humanity, right? Who is in the state of sin and then through baptism is led out into the promised land of salvation, right? Easy. That's like, grade school level allegorical reading when it comes to scriptural interpretation. Okay. So that's the point. So the point of the Moses leading the people across, or across the river Jordan is even better if you want to do the baptism into the promised land thing, because then you got the river Jordan where Jesus is baptized and stuff. So that one works even better. You can do it with the Red Sea too. Um, but anyway, okay. So, uh, so fine. Um, and actually, that one, the, 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 the Jordan River one is even cooler, though, because then you've got, like, Joshua, who leads the way, right, whose name is Jesus. Anyway, whatever. Point is, um, you've allegorized it, right? So what do you do now? So, okay, so that story means, you know, 
Baptist, Jesus leading you to baptism and then into the promised land of salvation. That's what that's. So once you get it, you throw away the original, right? Because like the rest of the, the only point of the other story is to tell you to point to this, you know, to the big story, right? The the upper story, which is the real point of the whole thing. No, that is not how the allegory of the theologians works. The original story, you hold on to it. It's still important. It's still true. It's true on both levels, right? It's also history. It's also like there was a dude named Moses and a dude named Joshua, and they led a bunch of other dudes, right, from one place to another, and there was water involved, right? So, like, it's, there's the literal level, and the literal level is true and important on its own level, right, and for its own reasons, but also you have the other. So, whereas with personification allegory, the tendency is to, tra- is to, you know, the, 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 the literal level is merely a vehicle to convey the higher level. In the allegory of the theologians, both of them are true. Both of them matter. Both of them are real in this way. And so, therefore, you end up not with just, again, a kind of game, right? A kind of a, 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 a riddle to decode. Instead, you end up with this multi-layered experience where you're basically getting two stories at the same time. Right. Um, uh, yeah, exactly, Bruce. It's allegorized within Scripture itself. That's why it's such a gimme, right? <laughs> exactly, because the New Testament authors do the same thing. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So okay. So that's the other way in which the alleg- so the allegory of the theologians differs from the allegory of the poets in these two primary ways. One in that it's primarily a, an allegory of reading rather than an allegory of writing, and two, it is uh, it maintains multiple levels simultaneously and insists on sort of the validity of the story. It's a way of adding new dimensions to a story rather than merely uh, using one as a sort of a stepping stone to the other or as a mechanism for discovering the other. Um, So, and yes, this is very much related to types in theology, Stephen. Typology, if the one is called personification allegory generally, typological allegory is what the allegory of the theologians is often referred to. Uh, that idea of types, uh, or the typos uh, the, from the Greek word, um, it's, that, that's exactly what it's kind of pointing to. That yes, like uh, Joshua is a type of Christ, right? Um, that doesn't mean he's only a symbol. That, like when we read the story of Joshua, we should just be like translating that in our heads, like Joshua equals Jesus, even though the names are technically the same. But um, Joshua equals Jesus, um, and so therefore, whenever we're reading Joshua, we should just be like decoding it, right? Like what is it actually trying to tell us about Jesus, right? That would be how we would read it if it were a personification allegory. But when we read it typologically, instead, we have we can see the two different stories kind of relating to each other, right, and overlaying each other in this way. Um, the idea of uh, the idea of typology is if it's a, it's like an outline that gets filled in, right? Um, the the um, uh, the outline itself, usually you can't fully understand. Um, I should have, uh, uh, I should have, I should have pulled this up. Um, I didn't think to before class started, but um, many of you are old enough. I tried to do that. I remember trying to do this analogy or this illustration uh, with my undergraduate students even years back. And uh, they were like, too young to understand this, but many of you are old people too, and so we'll also get it. Um, Alfred Hitchcock, right? The famous intro to Alfred Hitchcock films. Uh, remember, it starts off with that like weird squiggly line, which if you've never seen a Hitchcock movie before, you look at this weird squiggly line, and you're like, what is that? Like a, a bracket, like a, a curly bracket of some sort? It's just like this abstract set of of lines, right? And then what happens? Alfred Hitchcock, with his very distinctive almost as distinctive as Dante profile, right? Walks out into and fills in uh, the, pro- the the lines. And so then you see that the lines all along were in fact a stylized profile of his face, right? And before, um, um, before that, uh, before he stepped out, again, if you'd never seen it, you, you might not have been able to figure it out. You probably wouldn't have known what those lines meant. But once the 
once he steps out and fills it in with his face, now you see, okay, now I, I get it. Now I see what it was all about. That is the kind, so like the, the, the type, the squiggly lines, that's the type, right? That's the shadow. That's the, that's the thing, right? Um, and you don't get it, right? So if you're just reading Joshua cross, you know, leading the people across the river Jordan for, to stick with that one for a second, if you, if you're just reading that, you, if you don't, if you've, if you've, if, you know, Jesus has never stepped forward and filled in the outline, you won't know that, like, what it's at, what, you know, this, this other level of what it's really about. You might kind of like it, right? You might think it's kind of fun. Uh, you, you know, you might really appreciate it for many other way, for many other reasons. You know, it's like, hey, maybe you, you're into that kind of art, right? And you take that little squiggly profile and you put it up on your wall or something and you like it, but, but you don't get it, right? You don't understand because you've never seen Alfred Hitchcock's profile before. Anyway, that's, how um, typology works. That's the concept of typology. But again, it, it's about, notice how it's about amplifying the meaning, right? Multiplying the meaning of the, not replacing, not uh, displacing, um, not merely decoding the original. Okay, now, why am I telling you all this stuff? Well, I'm getting to that. But let's talk a little bit more. Let's do, uh, let's, there's one more thing that we should talk about because it's, it's going to be relevant. Uh, famously, and this was back to St. Augustine especially, was big on this, uh, and there were others, of course, who, he didn't invent it, but it was it, others who uh, um, talked about this and carried this on. This is the, traditionally, when you interpret scripture in this way, when you're doing this kind of typological reading, when you're doing this kind of, uh, of, of allegorical reading of scripture, you read scripture on four levels. You perform a fourfold exegesis of scripture. Um, and the four levels upon which you can, in theory, read any story or passage in the Bible are first the literal, sometimes called the grammatical historical, that is what the words actually mean and what the story is actually about, right? So that's what they mean by the literal level of the text. So to take an example, let's go back to the crossing of the Red Sea. Moses, right? Uh, leads the people across the Red Sea. Okay, so the literal level of the story of the crossing of the Red Sea uh, is about the historical event, right? There was a dude named Moses, and he led the Israelites out of a place called Egypt, and there was a big body of water, and they walked across on dry land, right? And they went to the other side in order to get to this country that they were hoping to move into, which they called the Promised Land. So that is the literal uh, level of the story of the crossing of the Red Sea. Then you have the allegorical level, and this is generally the sort of typological level. Um, this is the one where you're you're generally seeing, it's usually about Jesus, not always, but very often about Jesus. Um, so the allegorical level or the typological level, um, uh, the, so, so the allegorical reading of the crossing of the passage, you know, describing the crossing of the Red Sea would be, uh, that the Red Sea is the waters of baptism, right? That Egypt represents the state of bondage to sin, right? The slavery uh, to sin, uh, and that in order to become and 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 you know you're at war with your flesh, right? And so you've got Pharaoh's armies charging in on them, um, and it is only through the waters of death, right? The waters of baptism, which you see uh, how the flesh is killed, uh, right? By the waters of baptism, by how the waters fold in over, you know, and and drown uh, Pharaoh's army, but the Israelites emerge on the other side heading to the promised land, right? And so that is, so So Moses in this uh, is like Jesus leading us through uh, baptism and into the promised land on the other side. So that would be the allegorical level reading of the text. Now there's also a, oh, sorry, William, yes, uh, apologies uh, there. The word exegesis, it just means interpretation, basically. Uh, exegesis means like drawing something out of the text, right? Eisegesis means like putting something into the text. That's like the word you use insultingly, like when you're like, that sounded like a bit of eisegesis to me. But anyway, uh, exegesis is drawing something out of the text. Uh, it just means interpreting, basically. Um, okay, so, uh, so literal level, story of Moses and the Israelites. Allegorical level, uh, the allegory is like, uh, you know, Jesus and uh, the, you know, bapti the waters of baptism and leading to salvation. The moral level of this now is, again, reading it as 
a moral allegory. So in, in, in the moral reading of it, you would have, let's see, let's do, let's do a good moral interpretation of the crossing of the Red Sea. We would have um, uh, the Israelites, again, represent like humanity, right? Every man. And there is a narrow moral path with like death on either side, right? And you must walk the, there's only one narrow dry path through, uh, you know, through, through the waters and to escape from moral destruction, which lies beyond, you must follow the narrow path in order to attain, uh, you know, moral, uh, uh, you know, like a sort of moral and spiritual, spiritual enlightenment on the other uh, enlightenment on the other side. So focusing on like the narrow dry path through the waters uh, would be one way to do the moral allegory of that passage. See how that's different from the allegorical. It's not like about on that level. You're not talking about like Jesus and, and salvation. You know, you're talking about, applying it to the moral situation of any individual person. Um, so similar to, not identical with the allegorical level. And then the fourth level, on the fourth reading that you do of the passage is the anagogical level. And that refers to like where we are being led. That's like, it's about... Uh, it's a, it's it's about eternity. Like, what does this tell us about the ultimate destiny of the human soul? Because all passages in Scripture also tell us something about the ultimate destiny of the human soul, obviously. So, um, what does this tell us about the ultimate destiny of the human soul? So, again, here you can you can say um, that you would configure. Let's see, how would you do this? You would configure uh, the um, Egypt is the um, the sort of natural world into which we are all born again in a state of sin, uh, right? Um, and we are being led towards, so the promised land here would be heaven, right? And the mechanism for heaven, again, that path, that that one dry path uh, through the waters, uh, uh, the waters obviously in this case are death, right? Um, and the only way to cross the sea, through the sea of death on dry land, as it were, right, is the path of salvation that is opened by Christ. Uh, and so that leads us to salvation on the other side. That would be something like the anagogical uh, reading uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the Red Sea passage. I'm doing this so that you see how this kind of thing works, right? And again, remember the overall point here. The overall point is that all of these things are true simultaneously, right? It's about adding layers of enrichment onto the text, onto any text. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's so it's not, no, and no one of them invalidates any of the other. And so this, this habit, this skill, um, uh, of the, of reading, right. Uh, is, um, it trains you to see many things at the same time. It trains you to a way of thinking about stories where you're not looking for one definitive solitary interpretation, right? Because you're used to maintaining multiple, uh, different, sometimes conflicting, conflicting in the sense of like, so like it's possible for instance, to have, to be allegorized. I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but to be allegorizing a particular passage of scripture where in one level, right? One figure is Jesus and this other figure is Satan say, but in a, in, in, in one of the other levels of exegesis, the one who was Satan in the other one could be Jesus in the other reading. You see what I mean? Like it's it, that that's what I mean by saying that sometimes the different levels of interpretation can even conflict with each other in that way. But it's all good. It's all good. It's fine. You can kind of hold those all in your mind at once. And the experience of reading is to be enriched by all, not is not to choose among them, but to be enriched by all of them. Um, so now. Don't get me wrong. Don't try to think that I'm don't think that I'm trying to say everybody in the Middle Ages read the Bible like this all the time. I'm saying this was a very prominent uh, 
school of thought uh, for much of the Middle Ages. It was hardly universal, uh, and nobody ever did the whole Bible this way successfully, right? There are some places where there was more success than others, right? Like the Red Sea is two thumbs up. Um, uh, Noah's Ark, easy, man. Um, Song of Songs, absolutely. We love that, right? We love that uh, 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 St. Augustine just just uh, absolutely loved uh, uh, the Song of Songs. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Serena, yeah, that's a really good example. So Serena says, so for instance, in the story of David and Goliath, right, on the allegorical level, David is like Christ, right? But on the moral level, David stands in for humanity, right? Yeah, exactly. Those would seem like, you know, if you're trying to reconcile them, if you're trying to get like a reading out of the, out of the, it's, it's not going to work, right? Or at least it's not going to help. You're going to feel like you're going to have to choose, right? Why choose? It all works all at once. So yeah, that's a really good example. Jonah. Oh yeah. We love Jonah, David. Again, so there's some of these stories which are like, you know, um, which were like candy, uh, <laughs> some would say like crack uh, to uh, medieval allegorists. Uh, but um, but yeah, they, they just they just they just they they just loved this stuff. Um, anyway, so that's uh, that's how all of this worked, and this is all, and I'm about to get around to how this is uh, how this is important. Let me um, uh, let me come back and just answer a couple questions here. Um, uh, okay. Uh, David uh, was, uh, David Attlee was asking, is this type of analysis common in evangelical Christianity or is it restricted mostly to medieval Catholicism? Mostly to medieval Catholicism. There are some in uh, modern evangelical circles who admire this kind of thing, but I don't, I've never really met, maybe there are some, but I've never really met evangelicals who uh, really got into the fourfold exegesis. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> I was about to say more, but I think I won't. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's mostly, mostly medieval Catholicism. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and yes, Arthur, you are absolutely correct that this is very similar to uh, many Jewish traditions uh, of interpretation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And is there some influence there? Yes, I think there is some influence there. Um, but um, yeah, no, this is... Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, see, okay, see, Serena, that's exactly where I wasn't wanting to go. But uh, that is to say, I don't want to get into critiquing ways in which evangelicals tend to do this kind of thing or try to do this kind of thing, because that is so far beyond where I want to go. Um, but, but yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's, there are definitely people who talk about this. Um, let me, let me leave it there. There are people who will still talk about reading scripture this way, but I've read medieval exegetes and I've listened to modern evangelical sermons and I don't think they're actually very similar. Let me just leave it there. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so, so what am I saying? Like, I've read St. Augustine and you, sir, are no St. Augustine. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, but um, yeah. So anyhow, um, Dante, why am I going into all of this stuff about Dante? Because... We now begin to approach one of the things that makes the Divine Comedy that was completely mind-bending about the Divine Comedy from, like, the day of its release, right? The day that, that the Divine Comedy dropped, uh, it has been blowing people's minds, and this is one of the primary reasons that it has been blowing people's minds. Dante writes the Divine Comedy, in the allegory of the theologians. That's not supposed to be possible. First of all, you're doing it wrong, right? That's the, that's the allegory of reading, not the allegory of writing. But Dante, knowing that full well, sits down and says, no, I am going to write a story. 
I'm going to write a poem to which this reading can be applied, but not, but I, the author, I'm going to be in control of that. I'm going to tell a story deliberately. I'm going to set out to tell a story that works like that, not a surface level that you decode in order to understand the higher level and then leave, let the chaff be still, right? But a story that works exactly like that, that works on multiple levels. And each one is true in a sense. Each one, you hold on to each one and each one enriches the other rather than uh, just pointing to some other one. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that's what that's what Dante sits down to do in the Divine Comedy. And it's pretty amazing. Um, there's another sense in which he achieves. So now you might say, well, hang on a second. Starting at point number one, you know, so, so I, hang on. Well, I, let me, okay, I'll get a slide for this. Okay. You could define Dante's fourfold allegory in more than one way. Um, you could say there's more than four levels. I just chose four because, hey, that's the traditional number. Um, so let me let me explain what I mean by allegory, by Dante's fourfold allegory and his story and how it's like the allegory of the theologians. First, you have the literal level. Now, you might say from the get go, hang on a second, time out. It's not the same. Right. This is not a true story. Right? He's not really trying to say this is a true story. Like he actually himself personally traveled into hell, did he? Right. That's not he's not trying to say that, is he? No, no, he's not trying to say that. Um, uh, I don't believe that that is um, probably he's almost certainly probably not saying that. Um, besides which, anyway, it's supposed to be a vision. Uh, it's kind of a vision poem, uh, like he's kind of going to wake up uh, at the end of the Paradiso. So um, is this really a vision that he had? In that level, it would be true, wouldn't it? If this were a dream, um, so like there, 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 there are good reasons to put the Divine Comedy into the genre, which is a famous medieval, a popular medieval genre of dream vision poems, right? A poem that the poet tells about, like you know, like the poet goes to sleep near the beginning of the poem and then uh, tells the dream and then wakes up at the end. Um, Chaucer loved the dream vision genre; he had a whole bunch of dream vision poems. Um, Dante, there are good reasons uh, to, of course, uh, Tolkien fans will, uh, you know, might know of Pearl, uh, which was also a very famous dream vision poem, one of Tolkien's favorite poems, uh, which he translated. Um, so, uh, so it is possible in that way to say the literal level is true in the sense of it is a true vision or dream that he had exactly. He could have had some kind of mystical experience, Serena. Uh, so on that level, um, it can be sort of true in that sense. Certainly in, in, in this way, certainly more true than Pilgrim's Progress, right? Which again has no desire, for, again, no attempt for reality other than what it's conveying on the higher level. There's another sense in which the literal level is sort of true in that it's one way in which I've heard this argued or you know, heard this explained is that almost everything that happens, Dante invents almost nothing in this poem. That is, he doesn't make up characters. He, he everything that he encounters in this story, um, other than like, they, like, not necessarily, you know, the lion, you know, in the first canto, right? Which like the vague uh, lion. Um, but, you know, all of the like named characters, like everybody that he encounters, everybody he interacts with, and these are all things that are from outside his own imagination. That is, they're either real historical people that he's talking to, or they're um, characters which have been drawn from other works, either from the Bible itself or from um, other works of literature and stuff like He doesn't invent anything. Um, so that's another sense in which the literal level is 
has a, a, a sort of an existence outside of his own. Ima- He's not just making stuff up, right? This is not just, let me tell you a story about a guy named Everyman, right? It's, it's not, it's not like that. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, so there's the literal level. The literal level is the story uh, and we need to be following this story, right? The story of Dante who descends into hell and is guided by Virgil. Warning from the beginning. Dante, the character, is not necessarily the same as Dante, the author. Um, there's plenty of overlap. But this is a dramatic... This is not autobiography. This is a, something much more carefully constructed than that. Okay. Um, now, those of you who have perhaps taken one of my Signum Chaucer classes uh, will know that I make a pretty detailed argument about Chaucer being separate from his narrator. I would say that so if you've if you've heard me make that argument in Chaucer's case, let me say to you, not quite like that. <laughs> that is Chaucer, but the main difference is the spirit. Chaucer's is so much more playful than Dante. Dante takes himself extremely seriously, and Chaucer almost never takes himself seriously. Um, so Dante's character is not a an object of fun in the way that Chaucer's eponymous character usually is. Um, uh, Chaucer tends to be playing around with things, with narrative levels and stuff. Um, in ways, Dante's not... Dante doesn't... I won't say Dante doesn't play. I think he sometimes plays. But he doesn't play much. <laughs> I mean, he's he's pretty serious about himself and about what he does almost all the time. Dante, I believe, takes himself very seriously autobiographical footnote. I think this is why I defected from Dante to Chaucer back in my graduate days, because I couldn't take it. <laughs> like, I I don't take myself quite seriously enough to be a Dante or a Shakespeare person, I think. Um, uh, anyway. Um, but, um, okay. Uh, so, literal level. <clears throat> the literal level is the story of Dante the pilgrim, Dante the character, Right. And his interactions with Virgil and all the other folks and the journey that he is taking from where he begins, which hopefully we'll get to before the end of class and uh, where he's going to ultimately get to, which is the beatific vision of God himself at the end of the Paradiso. So that's the literal level. Is there an allegorical level? Yes, there's an allegorical level. Doesn't the allegorical level usually mean that, like, this person is a type of Christ? Well, yes. Yes, it does. So, you may have noticed that in Canto 1, which we read, and which I am actually alluding to now, um, the sun rose. It's dark, it's night at first, and then the sun rises, which is comforting. Um, The date... There's a passage later on which enables you to calculate the date uh, of this. We know the year. He gives the year in the first line. Um, 1300. <clears throat> exactly. 1300. Um, because he was born in 1263. And so he was 35 in 1300. And 35, of course, is halfway through life's way. Uh, the expected age of a uh, man, of course, is three score and ten, uh, you know, as it says in the Bible. Uh, Proverbs? Is that in Proverbs? I think it's in Proverbs. I'm, I'm for, is it Psalms? I'm forgetting where that is. The three score and ten. Anyway, yeah, so Veronica, exactly. Uh, the day that is dawning at the beginning of Canto 1 is Good Friday. What's important about that? What happened on Good Friday? Psalms. It is Psalms. Thank you, Serena. The crucifixion happens on Friday. So what's Jesus's, I, what's Jesus's ag- agenda for the day? Right? Right. 
wake up, get betrayed. He kind of never went to bed the night before, right? Um, get tried, right? Be condemned to death, get executed, and descend into hell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. So on, so Good Friday is going to be the day that he's going to descend into hell, right? And the next day, Dante, the character, is going to be rising up on the other side to purgatory and seeing all of those souls. What was Jesus doing on Saturday? Holy Saturday? Does anybody know what Jesus was up to? This is a trickier question, right? I bet you knew what Jesus was doing on Good Friday, and I bet you knew what Jesus was doing on Easter Sunday, but did you know what Jesus was up to on Holy Saturday? Absolutely, Chris. He was harrowing hell. Um, the harrowing of hell. So this was a favorite story. Uh, in It's not in the Bible, by the way, um, so don't look for it there. Um, but it is a very traditional story in medieval Catholicism. Uh, the harrowing of hell uh, is when Jesus descends to hell and he kicks in the gates of hell will not stand against him, right? He kicks in the gates of hell uh, and he takes out of hell because everybody who died previously was in hell, right? I mean, where else could they go, right? So they were all in hell waiting for him, right? And then Jesus goes down and he kicks in the door and he takes all of the saints, right? He takes all of the, the like all the patriarchs, right? You know, the, you know, Abraham's waiting for him and, you know, and Isaac and Jacob, they're all waiting for him, right? Uh, and David, everybody. And so he brings them out, right? And he takes them up with him to paradise, right? Obscure Bible trivia time. When Jesus and the souls from hell get up there, get up to paradise, they find three people sitting around and waiting for them. Who were they? What three people are waiting? Bible trivia time! Okay. Right? Yep, Elijah, that's one, right? He got the direct ticket. And, and Enoch, absolutely. Enoch is the other. Enoch walked with God and was not, right? Because he, he was translated, right? So Enoch goes straight to heaven. Elijah is taken straight up to heaven. That's two. Who's the third? Anybody? It's kind of a trick question. It's a little bit of a trick question. Answer. The thief who speaks to Jesus on the cross, to whom Jesus says, this day you shall be with me in paradise. Boom! Oh, that's the third one. So anyway, um, okay. So the harrowing of hell, though, right? They take the they take all of the the the, the blessed dead, and he brings them up into heaven. Uh, and now, like the heavenly party can begin, and everybody's up there. And then he goes back. Jesus, that is, goes back and is raised from the dead again on Easter Sunday. So the Divine Comedy takes place over three days. <laughs> Inferno happens on Good Friday, Crucifixion Day the day that Jesus descends into hell. And on that day, Dante, the character, descends into hell, going down into the very bottom of hell. And then on the second day, on Holy Saturday, he goes to purgatory, seeing all of the souls who are on their way to heaven, right? Who are going to be gathered into heaven, right? And then, of course, it's Sunday uh, when he goes into paradise. Right, uh, the resurrection day. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's um, see the allegorical level. So wait, Dante is suggesting that he is a an allegory of Christ. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we take ourselves. <laughs> very seriously. Okay. Uh, second level, the moral level, right? Think about the first canto, 
right? It's easy to see the moral level. So now on the allegorical level, right, Dante in the dark wood at, is like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on Monday, Thursday before the crucifixion, right? In the, you know, this is the, this is the allegorical parallel to, you know, if it be possible that this cup should pass from me, right? That's, that's, that's the allegorical level of Canto One, right? The time in the dark wood. The, but the, the moral level, no problem. Right. We can easily do a moral level of that story. You've got like the wood of of sin and uh, and and, and of, of moral darkness right, that he's in. And then there's the hill with the light on it. And he's trying to climb the hill towards the light. Um, we can easily do a moral allegory here. Is it a it's a literal story about Dante, the character? Right. And showing his progress, both spiritual and sort of literary also as well. But it's also an allegory of Christ. It's also a moral story. And it's also political, um, which seems like a bit of a come down. <laughs> right. But it's also about the politics of uh, it's also about the politics of, um, of Florence. But here's the thing. That would not have been considered. Dante would not have thought of that level as banal compared with the others because the posture that he was taking towards it from the beginning, as you can see in the remember the description of the wolf who is to come, who shall chase away the she wolf and who will be born between two felts. Remember that that passage in Canto one. Right. It's prophecy. Right. So his political message is not just a political commentary, right? It's so it's possible, of course, to read the political level of the Divine Comedy as a kind of like almost like a series of contemporary political cartoons, right? Um, you know, Dante c critiques the papacy, part forty-seven. Like that's it's possible to uh, uh, to view it that way, um, but that's does not seem to be um, the way that he. Um, the way that he would have thought of it, right? And again, from the beginning, we can see the posture that he takes towards the political stuff. It's not, you know, it's not a like a history of the political situation. It's not a critique of the political situation. It is a prophetic view. So in this way, it is parallel to the anagogical one. Now, what is the anagogical level? The fourth level of the allegory normally? It's about salvation. It's about our path to salvation. Well, that's a little on the nose when it comes to the divine comedy, don't you think? I mean, the whole thing is about, a, you know, about, you know, the ultimate destiny of souls. Right. Um, so he doesn't do the analog, the anagogical level just in that way. Right. But what he does do is this. He does do a level of his story which talks about where, you know, the like realm of Italy is headed, like what its destiny is. And so it's a it's a basically a prophetic posture towards the politics. So anyway, yeah, Jameson, yeah, Jameson says that wolf had some serious Rome vibes, didn't it though? Right? Kind of makes you think emperor, right? Kind of, you know, like the whole wolf thing with the Romulus thing and you're like, yeah, okay, right? Mhm. Mm kind of leading you in that direction, sure. Yep, no, that's not an accident. Um absolutely. So okay. Anyhow, so it's not like um, I'm not now. Don't misunderstand. We're not going to do like tease out every single level, every passage all the way through the text. I just wanted to point out. I wanted to make sure we appreciate the project that Dante has undertaken here. It is amazing, amazing what he has undertaken here. Nobody had ever done this before. And frankly, nobody's ever done it since. No one's ever succeeded in doing it like Dante did it. I think that Dante achieves this kind of thing better than anyone I've ever seen achieve it. Um, uh, I think he tries harder than almost anybody else I know. And there might be other examples, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, maybe people can think of, uh, you know, other folks who have done a similar thing. But man, um, when he did this, you know, there's like the audacity of it. You know, read my poem like you would read the Bible. I mean, treat my work like scripture, right, is uh, bold. 
that's bold. Um, but it's um, awe-inspiring uh, in its magnitude and in its daring. So anyway, that's... Um, um, uh, I just want to make sure that there's like a kind of a pre so, and this is another reason, by the way, that I don't just want to be getting into like decoding, right? Trying to, you know, like what is the reference? Because there's no single answer to that question. So what is the wolf in that passage? Is the wolf probably like a Holy Roman emperor who's going to come down and set things to rights and put the Pope in his place? Probably. That seems very, I, I, find that a very believable interpretation there. Is that then what the wolf means? No, that's one thing that the wolf means, right? But I think, does it also work on the moral level? Sure. Can it also work on the, absolutely. Yeah. There's much more that can, so it's another reason why I'm resistant to, and why I want you to resist that twitchy sensation to look things up in the notes. Right. Because most likely the notes are going to choose one of these. Right. They're going to say, like, here's here's he's probably referring to this or that. And often it's going to be the political level that it's glossing because we need more help with that. Right. We don't know these dudes. Right. These 13th century dudes without help. Uh, most of them anyway. And um, uh, and, you know, so a lot of the notes are going to focus on that. But if we just focus on that, if we allow ourselves to then like, I don't want you to let that dominate you know, your view of the passages you're reading, because there's, he always meant there to be more to it than that. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, uh, and yes, Jameson, I completely agree. There are also other, there's certainly other ways in which it can be interpreted. I'm not trying to restrict it to just these four. I'm just trying to illustrate the concept, essentially, of how he means his poem to be interpreted in the way how he's done both. Essentially, he has set out as a poet to write the theology, the 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 allegory of the theologians, which is unbelievable. Um, the last thing that I have to say, if I didn't say anything about this in the first class, it would be utterly and completely inexcusable. The language. That is, it's written in Italian. Now, you know this, and I've already mentioned that. Um, but I, I need to make sure everybody understands that that's a huge deal, right? Dante is here. It's gutsy enough to set out to do the allegory of the theologians. And as you say, David, to like set yourself up as an allegory of Christ, right? I guess that's, that's already, you know, setting you up for pretty high levels of chutzpah right there, right? But um, he then goes one step further in saying, and I'm not going to write this in Latin. I'm going to write this in Italian. Nobody did that. Now, it's not to say that nobody wrote literature or poetry in vernacular languages. It's not like he's the first one ever to do that at all, right? But you have to understand, in medieval culture, Latin wasn't only... Let me make a parallel. In the ancient Mediterranean world, Greek was... Greek in the... Now, this is an awkward parallel, and there are lots of... It's, Think ways in which this parallel isn't exact, but there are a lot of ways in which Greek in the ancient Mediter Mediterranean world, like um, you know, like the the uh, you know early Roman Empire time of the Mediterranean world, Greek was like uh, what English is in the modern business world, right? Um, this kind of like lingua franca that a lot of people, you, I mean, many people use English that way in the modern world. Um, Greek was like almost everybody in the Mediterranean, especially anybody who like wanted to interact with anybody from any other culture, basically had some kind of Greek. Right. Um, and this, of course, is the kind of Greek uh, that um, is the kind of Greek that uh, that the New Testament was written in. Right. This kind not, not exactly like street Greek, but anyway, uh, it's not written in Homeric Greek. <clears throat> right. It's not the uh, the sort of highfalutin Greek. Uh, it's um it's the, 
Um, and exactly, Stephen, it is exactly why the New Testament is written uh, in Greek and not in Aramaic, right? Which is what most of the people who wrote it would have actually spoken as their native language, right? Um, what Jesus himself spoke as his native language, presumably. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's written in, because, again, that's like it's the it's the language everybody knows. Often, when modern people think back to the Middle Ages, they think about Latin in a similar kind of way, right? Latin was the, I mean, everybody spoke Latin, right? Everybody had Latin. And so it was a way in which people could communicate, even if they couldn't communicate in any other way. Um, now, in a way, that's kind of true. But that parallel radically misplaces or misunder would lead you to misunderstand the status of Latin in the Middle Ages. Um, yes, it was a common language which connected all of the cultures of, you know, the Europe of the Middle Ages. But it's it was nothing like the Greek that people spoke down the marketplace, uh, you know, in coastal towns in Italy or North Africa, right, in order to trade with each other. It was not like that at all. Um, Latin was understood to be... Um, uh, Latin is understood to be higher than the common languages, right? Um, more, not just more, not more esoteric, that's the wrong word, more elegant. The lower language, I mean, look, the regular language, like Italian and French and Spanish, uh, these were corrupted versions, right? Those were like, I mean, Latin and Italian were essentially, that was essentially street Latin on different streets, right? In different parts of Europe. That was like, those languages were under, the vernacular languages were understood to be um, base, right? I mean, like the simple, simplistic, even inelegant, clumsy. I, uh, they, they, they had no style. They didn't have the elegance and the grace of Latin. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, um, yes, Chris, exactly. It was not a language of common interchange, but a language of scholarship and disputation. Exactly. It was, it was a lingua franca, but it was a lingua franca among intellectuals, essentially. Um, but again, even from a purely literary standpoint, if you wanted to be taken, you could write vernacular stuff. You could write vernacular poems. You could write poems in French or Italian or whatever, right? But you couldn't expect to be taken seriously, right? You wouldn't be like a real artist. Um, it's like the difference between being a painter and merely illustrating comic books, right? Being a comic book illustrator. Now, if any of you are graphic novelists or illustrators, that might have made you bristle when I said that, right? Well, it made Dante bristle too, right? And those of you who, who are illustrators of that kind, consider that if, you know, in this parallel, you have Dante as your champion because he stepped forward and said, you know what? No, no. Italian is capable of sophistication, elegance, beauty, and complexity, at least the equal of Latin. Don't you tell me, right? He obviously could do Latin and wrote most of his treatises and things in Latin. Um, but um, he... Uh, <laughs> William De Filippo says, I'm actually drawing a comic as I listen to this lecture. Well, there you go. I bet I startled you when I said that. Um, but... Um, uh, yeah, so Stephen, exactly. So in that narrative, the comic book illustrators are a type of Dante, who is in turn a type of Christ. You're following along. That's exactly it. You're 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 right in the spirit of it, Stephen. That's just right. Um, um, exactly. So okay, and and now and Chris, you're sure right. Like the troubadours going around. Yeah, sure, they were composing. Uh, they were they were composing vernacular poetry, but no one was going to mistake them for Virgil anytime soon, right? I mean, come on. Um, so if you wanted to be considered literature, you had to write in Latin. Everybody knows this. Dante was the first person 
uh, to succeed in defying that, right? In just saying, absolutely not. I am going to speak in the Italian of Florence. I'm going to take my language and I am going to use it as a vehicle for very high subject matter, divine things, right? I'm going to, I'm going to talk about divine and spiritual things in language that anybody on the street could understand. Um, and, uh, you know, anyway, so that was, that was a, a startling thing. Um, Chaucer, of course, later in this, that century, 1300, again, is the date of the events. No one knows exactly when the Divine Comedy was written a little bit after that. It is, uh, presumed. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, it's, you know, right, written right around the turn of the century. Chaucer was, of course, writing, uh, the better part of a century later. He was late, uh, you know, he was living in the second half, uh, of the 14th century. So he was, uh, you know, born well after Dante was dead. Um, and, uh, he did the same thing with English. He was the first one to say, you know what? No, like, I'm just going to write in English. This is, uh, this is going to be my poetic medium. Um, so yeah, exactly. So William, all of the great English, but this is why Chaucer is considered the father of English poetry, not because he was the first person ever to write in English, but because he was the first person to self-consciously undertake high literature in English and make it stick basically and have everybody be like, yep, that's pretty much the best poem ever been written in England by an English person. And it's in English. What do you know? Um, uh, and so he was the one who really began. So the poetic tradition, by, I mean, by the time you get uh, to Shakespeare's day, Shakespeare, of course, whose highest ambition uh, was to be a famous poet, uh, just like Chaucer. Um, uh, you know, and of course, he had to write plays to pay the bills. But um, but he really, of course, everybody wanted to be a poet and they grew up. That's where the that's where the money was. Well, I mean. It wasn't even then, of course. That's why he wrote plays. But anyhow, um, uh, he he this th 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 he's following in Chaucer's footsteps self consciously, just as everybody from Boccaccio on down is consciously following in Dante's footsteps. So Dante is the one who began the movement of hey, vernacular literature is excellent as well. Um, he's the one who basically proved that it could be done. Um, so again, like just like count the number of ways in which the Divine Comedy is this tour de force, Dante doing a thing nobody thought was possible, nobody imagined you could you could do, um, that anyone would dare to do, again, on so many different la uh, levels, um, and he defied everyone and everything. Um, and, uh, and yes, Kit, exactly, then he has done, he has Virgil show up to lead him around, right, to show extremely explicitly I am the heir of Virgil, right? You should you should put this, uh, you should put my book, right? You should put your copy of the Divine Comedy right between your copy of the Aeneid and your copy of the Bible, right? That's just where it goes on your bookshelf. I I I organized it for you, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, I have an idea. Let's look at the text. Woohoo! We got to the text. All right. Um, so the first, this is the first nine lines in the Italian. I'm not going to try to read it because I'll do a bad job. Um, I don't trust my, I, I, I can, I can fake a little bit of Italian, but I don't want to insult anyone, any, any Italians or people who are good at Italian by reading it myself. The point that I want to make, um, uh, is I want, I want to, I want to, make sure that we understand what can be derived from this. This is my time when I am going to talk about poetic stuff because it's important for us to see what, um, how this works because we can understand some things about Dante and about his poem by looking at its shape. How does this work? How does this poem work? What do you notice? Tell me what you see. Good. Tarlonio, yes. You see, right away you notice the rhyme in the first line and the third line. Vita, oscura, smarita. Yep. Okay. 
we notice that it's been divided into threes. Three seems like a kind of important number in the Divine Comedy. We've got the three cantica, right? Inferno, Paradiso, and uh, and uh, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, right? Um, each one has 33 cantos, except for the Inferno, which has 34, because of this one is the intro canto. Um, we've got... Um, uh, and then we've got each we've got we're dividing into these three these these uh, these groups of, of three lines. Right. OK. Um, yeah. And exactly. The rhyme on the second line of each triplet connects to the first line of the next one. So you've got Vita Oscura Smarita Dura Forte Paura. paura right. So we have this this rhyme that ends the second line shows up three times, right? Oscura, dura, paura, and then we move on from that, right? The verse, this verse structure, which Dante invented, is called terza rima. Uh, it just means like three rhymes. And um, so notice the first, it's interlocked, right? If you put them together, right, you've got A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, right? So the lines are interlocked like this, right? You've got the, the two and one at the beginning, right? And then they go like this, right, with the next one. And then it connects like this with the next one. So that it is, on the one hand, very regular and alternating. And he keeps that up through all 100 cantos, of the Divine Comedy, um, you have this intricately interlocked set. Now, notice what this means. You can't, although it does kind of break down into these three line groups, you can't chunk it, right? You can't separate it. It's a fluid whole. It's not in stanzas, right? It's, you know, you don't, you, you, you it, it flows right through and connects uh, all the way through. Um, and, um, uh, you ha so you have multiple different ways, therefore, in which ideas are being linked together, uh, are being kind of con interconnected by the rhyme. So that the very first thing that we see is it's extremely intricate. It's extremely uh, meticulously organized, right? A very complicated repeating structure. And it's... Um, uh, did I mention structure? It's extremely structured. Um, Dante is very good at structure, very careful about structures. There are those who have argued that you can discern not only patterns in the number of lines in the different cantos of the comedy, but even in the number of syllables. Among, I mean... The level of complexity and precision of Dante's shaping of the verse is very remarkable. Um, I am not sure I completely believe all theories I have ever read about this kind of thing, but I do not disbelieve all of them. That is for sure. Um, I certainly put Dante high in the upper echelon of artists that I have, whose work I have experienced at all, as far as uh, level of attention to detail and intricacy of structure and attention to detail in intricacy of structure. He cares about that a lot. And we can see that right away from the rhyme scheme that he has uh, chosen. Um, uh, so there we go. Um, by the way, I think I, well, I didn't say in this class, but I said in one of the um, one of the times when I was talking about the translation I was choosing and stuff, um, I strongly recommend the Columbia Digital Dante Project. That is a wonderful resource where you can see um, the facing page, like a facing page Italian and Mandelbaum's translation, the one that I'm, the one that we're using in our discussion. Um, you can see that right there. It's got audio versions of it in Italian if you want to hear it. Um, and it's got uh, commentary by 
Teo de Linda Berellini, a wonderful Columbia Dante scholar who's, uh, uh, you know, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. Um, I knew Berellini when I was at Columbia. I actually studied with her teacher. That does not make us parallel. <laughs> but uh, Ferrante, Joan Ferrante, was uh, uh, was sort of the previous generation of Dante scholars at Columbia. Uh, I did take a, a Dante class with Ferrante, but um, she was wonderful. Um, anyway, uh, also, I took a lot of old French with her. She was great at that, too. Uh, but anyway, Berolini is amazing. Um, so great commentary from... Berolini there anyway lots of lot, lots of stuff there on that site strongly recommend it but I'm not a huge fan of the Italian reading and I, you could say how can I criticize the thing I don't like he swallows the ends of the lines I hate that I hate it I, like the rhyme is important okay like you can't even when I'm listening to it if I didn't know the rhyme was there I wouldn't even I wouldn't even hear it most of the time and I just I kind of feel like if you can't feel that, you must be doing it. I don't know Italian, but yeah, I'm like, you must be doing it wrong. When I, it's, it's such an important part of Dante, I can't. I, 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 so that's my quibble with the Italian reading, but whatever. Okay. Um, uh, great. All right. So um, uh, it, we've got a few. Got a few, I started a few minutes late, so let's, <clears throat> let's keep going for a few minutes. Not long, not long. But let's look at the beginning here. I told you we're going to be doing mostly introductory stuff in the first, uh, in the first session. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, I found myself within a shadowed forest, for I had lost the path that does not stray. Ah, it is hard to speak of what it was, that savage forest, dense and difficult, which even in recall renews my fear. So bitter, death is hardly more severe. But to retell the good discovered there, I'll also tell the other things I saw. Now, what do you notice in the opening gestures of the poem, right? The question I want to begin with here is, where are we? I know, lost in a dark forest, I know, but um, where is where does he put us as a reader, notice one of the very first things in that first line. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, not my life's way, our life's way, right? He's talking about his own life. He's saying, I was, when I was 35 years old, is one way to paraphrase that first line, of course. Um, in other words, it is the year 1300. That's another way to paraphrase that first line, of course. But yeah, Lynn, the hour is the really interesting thing there. Right. Um, yes, he's talking about his journey, but he is also implicitly connecting his journey to our journey, our life's journey. Right. Um, and thinking about his age as the moment in which he is um, uh, thinking about that as a point in the journey of life. Right. Um, is, of course, another way in which he's kind of pointing to like a moral level of this, uh, inviting us to uh, apply this, to interpret this in a moral way, right? So, oh, so I should think of... So notice how he's handing us in line one, right? I should think of the protagonist of the poem, right? I think of, Don, of the, you know, Dante, the speaker, the character, uh, the narrator, as he, he's like me, right? He's like a, an allegory of me in my own journey through life, Um by the use of the, and yeah, he does literally start in Medius, uh, race, uh, Tom, of course, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It can't, it, it doesn't get more in Medius race than the beginning of, of, of the comedy. That's for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Yeah. Oh, Jameson. Yeah. You were thinking the same thing about inviting us to think in terms of allegory. Absolutely. So then when he goes into, I found myself within a shadowed forest for I had lost the path that does not stray. Right. We're immediately like, oh, man, I've been there. Yeah. Like, I, I, I can totally relate to that, man. Like, again, allegorical level right away. Right. Haven't we? Aren't we kind of? It's November 4th, 2020. Aren't we kind of all in a shadowed forest right now? <laughs> right. Um, have you been feeling over the last six months? 
possibly the last 24 hours, like you have lost the path that does not stray, right? Again, I think we can all allegorize this in various ways. Um, um, notice I love what he does there with the path, right? Notice uh, he's not saying that I have strayed from the path. He reverses it, right? I lost the path. The path didn't stray, so I must have, <laughs> right? Um, I... He keeps the emphasis on the path itself. It is the uh, the non-straying nature of the path. It is the, I want to say, purity. Not necessarily straightness of the path. He doesn't say it's a straight path. He just says it doesn't stray. Um, so that you could interpret that as meaning, uh, you know, the straight and, and narrow path. Um, but... Um, and I think that, you know, of course, thinking about, uh, you know, the straight and narrow gate, uh, you know, in the New Testament, you can you can think about it in that way. Um, uh, but but again, I don't think that's the only way to think about it. Again, he he is the one who has wandered. Uh, the path uh, has not wandered, but he has lost it. It is hard to speak of what it was, that savage forest, dense and difficult, which even in recall renews my fear. Note the cue that he gives us again here as readers. It is hard to speak of what it was, that savage forest. In other words, it's not really a forest, or rather, it's not just a forest, right? It's hard to speak of what that forest was. That forest was something. It was something that it is hard for him to speak of, right? But it's... Um, it's not just something it's hard for him to speak of. Uh, it is a thing, and he can't just speak of it. He can point to it, right? He can describe it. And notice he gives us three descriptors in that line, in that next line. Savage, dense, and difficult, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, and those those are all three, real, and we can begin to think about those things. And by the way, do you see why I say every single word in Dante has inspired, like, reams of commentary, right? There's this, you see how it, like, it pushes, like, it's, we're line five and we're already doing it, right? We're already, we're already walking down that path. Uh, that's just exactly where it goes. Um, yeah, and Kit, he does emphasize his own lostness, absolutely. Um, and yes, Serena, it's also difficult to speak about because it's traumatic, right? When like recalling it renews his fear. Um, he he becomes paralyzed by fear just in in trying to remember it, so he can't he can't speak of it. And so, Serena, that's another way in which again, there's the literal level, right? Again, this is also. It's not just an. It's also a real story about a person, right? You know, this Dante character, right? The narrator character speaks like a real person, um, relating events from his own life and with a kind of with a kind of pain, with a with a with a, a sort of a depth of psychology that we can relate to on the literal level as well. Um, yeah, yeah, Um yeah, and absolutely, Emski two thousand six, um, and the Twitch channel also can the savage forest dense and difficult, uh, the shadowed forest, uh, you know where you've lost the path that does not stray, d does that map on to the political situation in Florence at the time from which he has been banished? Oh yes, oh oh, oh definitely, definitely, um, yeah. Um, yeah, David, good. And I encourage you to do this, by the way. Um, if you, um, uh, he was saying, and of course I happen to have the Italian on the previous slide. If you look at this line and Mandelbaum does do a line by line translation. This is what I, this is why I like the Mandelbaum translation. Um, he does not try to make it into like Dante's poetry. He doesn't try to maintain the rhyme scheme or anything like that. But what he does try to do is maintain, like, I'm going to try to give you the sense of that line in my line. Um, so it does go line by line, which is handy uh, to be able to read back and forth to the Italian. And so David was just pointing out that if you see there in line five, Selva, 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 Selvaggia uh, is, uh, it alliterates, um, just like the dense and difficult. That's why he chose dense and difficult. Mandelbaum, he tried to preserve the alliteration there. Um, yes, yes. Um, 
Yeah, good. Um, okay. Um, and yes, Craig, uh, Beatrice is dead. Beatrice is dead. Um, Dante's semi-theoretical girlfriend, um, who was a real woman, but he didn't start writing about their love relationship until after her death. Um, and by the way, one of the most brilliant, uh, Dante was really good at retcon too. Um, I, I won't get into it, but anyway, the Vita Nuova is a, is a pretty awesome set of poems by Dante and a pretty awesome piece of retcon. Um, uh, but, um, anyway, yeah, Beatrice and Dante didn't have a real intimate relationship. Um, according to him, they only spoke to each other once or twice, but, uh, anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. And you're right, Stephen. She's not only his semi-theoretical girlfriend. He's also, she's also his semi-theological girlfriend <laughs> as well. Aren't they all, uh, at this time? So yes. And of course I could go off on a whole nother long tangent about how he's also, Dante is also, in addition to all the other things that he's doing, taking the courtly love tradition and taking that and pushing it in an entirely new direction, which changes the nature of love poetry forever. Um, but there's no time. Um, and anyway, we won't really get to the Beatrice bits, uh, which are mostly in Paradiso. When we meet Beatrice, uh, well, Purgatory, we meet Beatrice. And then she becomes a main character uh, of Paradiso. <clears throat> We're mostly in Virgil land still. Anyhow, okay. Um, Death is hardly more severe than, you know, his fear. Um, death is hardly more severe. So he is... Comp Notice how, again, this sort of the suggestion of the allegorical overlay, the shadowed forest, passing through the shadowed forest is also like passing through death, right? It's like death. And from here, he's headed to hell you know, he's headed, he's headed on a guided tour of the afterlife. Um, so there is a way in which he is suggesting that what he's going to be narrating, there's a kind of spiritual drama to it as well. Not just a spiritual audio tour, right? It's, there, there's like a real, like where is he going to end up? What is going to happen to the soul of our hero, Dante the narrator, Right. And, uh, and so he's opening that allegorical level up and therefore making, inviting us to imagine the tour of the afterlife that is to follow in the rest of the poem. Um, he's going to be making that into, uh, uh, again, it's his own spiritual journey as well, half through, halfway through his life's way, right? Um, yeah. But to, to retell the good discovered there, I'll also tell the other things I saw. It's hard to recall this. It's painful to recall this, right? It renews his fear even to recall the events that happened and what he saw. But there was good that happened, and so therefore, he's also going to tell the other things that he sees. So he's going to tell the other things. That is, the scary things, the dark things, the horrible things as well. This, of course, is an answer to the question, gosh, isn't Inferno a little bit morbid, right? I, we're going to spend all this time looking at damned souls and all sorts of manner of uncomfortable things happening to all sorts of nasty people. Isn't this a little gruesome, right? Do, does this need to be so gruesome? What's going on here? What's the point here? What's the plan? To retell the good discovered there, I'll also tell the other things I saw. Here's the plan, right? Um, there is good discovered. This is part, this is an, these things are an important part of the journey. Journey in more than one sense, right? Um, journey on more than one level. And so these things are necessary. It's important. You, ha you have to start in the dark forest because that's where the story begins. And you have to go through, you have to see and understand hell and sin in order to get to where he's going to get to ultimately in the end. All right. I didn't want to not talk about any of the, um, <laughs> the, the, the... So there we go. We got through line nine. So we're almost done. No problem. We'll pick up the rest, the rest next time. So next time, I will show you my paces as we will get through. So read through, read Cantos 2, 3, and 4, 
next time we will get through the gates of hell uh, for next class. That's my goal, getting through the gates of hell. Uh, and uh, we'll see uh, we'll see where we go. So I'll let you guys go there. Thank you guys. Thanks for your patience. I know there's a lot of preliminary stuff here today, but I wanted to provide you some of this context so that we are a little better equipped uh, to read the poem in ways that are more like the kinds of things that Dante would have been expecting as from his readers, essentially. So, uh, all right. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. This was a lot of fun, and I look forward to we'll dig straight into the text next time uh, and we'll whip our way through the first four cantos, and it's going to be great. Thanks very much, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.